And now with the song Lithium, probably the biggest band in the world right now, the pleasure is all yours. Yes, sir, indeed. Please welcome Nirvana. Seattle's favorite son's Nirvana. It's Nirvana. Nirvana. It's Nirvana. 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 But unfortunately, Kurt's songs were so good that millions and millions of people uh, connected to it. You could either see it as, as a blessing or a celebration, or you could see it as some sort of curse. Ooh, that was a dramatic intro, wasn't it? Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Music Mongoose. Nirvana's success in the 90s caused a seismic shift in the music industry. This shift would inadvertently lead to the rise and fall of indie rock. But first, let's discern what indie actually means. It's a term more used commonly here in the UK. In the US, it's probably more known as alternative rock. Indie, short for independent, used to mean, well, exactly that. Music produced from independent record labels or no labels whatsoever. Bands like Fugazi and Pavement would come to mind. True indie bands in every sense of the word. But over the years, for reasons we're about to explore, the term indie transcended that definition to become not only a music genre in its own right, but a cultural attitude. To understand how Nirvana would cause indie's eventual downfall, let's first go to the beginnings of indie. Indie rock can trace its roots back to the late 70s, a time where punk bands began opting to sell music directly to consumers, rather than through big labels like Columbia, Atlantic, Capital and EMI. These labels were pretty much controlling the music industry at that point. And that wasn't very punk, yo. As punk became more popular in the US, infrastructure began to materialize to handle the demand. Small independent record labels began to pop up, along with record shops, clubs, college radios, and fanzines. This ideology found its way across the Atlantic to the UK as well, inadvertently causing its near destruction there. You see, the more popular that punk became, the less punk it was, according to the Buzzcocks anyway. They decided, in a last-ditch effort to cash in on the scene before it crumbled completely, to release Spiral Scratch, the EP many deemed to be the point at which indie rock music was born, and the point at which the English punk scene began to dissolve. This EP was one of the first physical punk materials to ever be released in England. The Damned and the Sex Pistols had released physical music beforehand, but this release by the Buzzcocks was so successful, it would go on to inspire a new wave of independent music across the UK. The band pressed and sold copies of their album totally on their own through their own record label. They walked into Virgin Records in Manchester and said, Hello, we want to sell this album, please. And they said, OK, let's start with 25 copies and we'll see how we go. The album ended up shifting 16,000 copies. This was truly the start of indie success. What's more, the EP itself is a scathing reflection of the punk scene in England. It predicted in real time its downfall. Just look at the track titles and you can begin to understand. Time's up. Boredom. Friends of mine. This EP was a hate letter to the scene in which the band operated, suggesting it was already too stereotyped and stifling. Pete Shelley said in an interview once, We didn't think there'd be any future. At that time, it looked like the gig was up, that people had found us out and the whole punk thing was just gonna die a death. Pete Shelley, of course, would then go on to take over from Howard Devoto in songwriting and vocals in the band. And really, he'd take the Buzzcocks completely out of the punk scene, introducing more hooky, poppy elements to their tracks. Of course, punk in one way or another survived, but this really did mark a shift in the UK music industry. Inspired by the DIY success, independent labels began to form all over the country, like Rough Trade, 4AD, and Mute. The 80s would become the golden era for so-called indie bands in England. New Wave, Mod Revival, and of course, post-punk would litter the landscape. Bands like Orange Juice, The Fall, The Smiths, and The Stone Roses would lead the charge. By the way, this cyclical process of a subculture becoming too popular causing its own destruction is a bit of a theme throughout this video, and indeed a theme throughout the history of all alternative music. Also inspired by the tales of the independent punk band that sold 16,000 copies of their EP, independent labels continued to rise in the US throughout the late 70s and 80s. Ian McKay and Jeff Nelson formed Discord Records, releasing music from their own band, Minor Threat, in LA. SST Records was set up by Greg Ginn to release his band's music, Black Flag. The Pixies, R.E.M. and Campervan Beethoven would all form in this period too. 
Chicago would be the home of Touch and Go. New York had Matador. North Carolina produced Merge. Tang would form in Boston. Indie labels were spreading like a disease across the states. In Seattle, Sub Pop was founded, signing the likes of what would become known as Grunge Outfits, Soundgarden, Mudhoney, and, yes, Nirvana. And much like how the Buzzcocks would end up destroying the scene from which they came, Nirvana and the rise of grunge would also too end up eating its young. Delicious. The beginning of the end for indie rock can probably be pinpointed to the moment Nirvana's Nevermind toppled Michael Jackson's Dangerous off the top of Billboard's album charts. I mean, just think about how symbolic that is. Nirvana, a scrappy punk band from seemingly nowhere, defeating Michael Jackson, a corporate commercial music powerhouse. A few years before the release of Nevermind, they had signed to major record label Geffen Records. I know that I'm too stubborn to allow myself to ever compromise our music or, you know, get so wrapped up in it and involved to where it's going to, you know, make turn us into big rock stars. I mean, I just don't feel like that. Everyone else accuses us of it, but... This was a move that many would criticize as selling out, but I don't really see it that way. Kurt Cobain was never really loyal to the Seattle grunge scene, and he always wanted success for his band. People put too much emphasis on scenes. I mean, just because there happens to be a, a town with a few really good bands in it, I mean, big deal. It, it's happened all over the place, in Minneapolis, in LA, in New York, all over the place, so it's, it's really no big deal. I don't understand this, like, community patriotism that everyone is, is boasting about in Seattle, because, like, they're claiming that they finally put Seattle on the map, you know, but, like... What map? Not the rest going up. The fact was, though, Nirvana signed those papers and left peers like Fugazi and Pavement behind, who would remain true independent artists. After signing to Gevin and releasing Nevermind, the band would become one of the greatest selling acts of all time, selling 75 million albums worldwide. Nirvana had proved it could be done, a band from nowhere ending up dominating the music industry. They'd done it. But at what cost? Well, while grunge and in turn indie grew and grew and grew, big corporations started to take note and would start the hunt for the next Nirvana. Cue the likes of Nickelback, Creed and Limp Bizkit receiving heavy investment in the hunt. Even Beck, the so-called king of the slackers, found himself at the receiving end of this investment. He went from busking country folk tunes on buses to also signing for the David Geffen Company. Big labels wanted to cash in on the cult scenes, bringing it to the masses. The same sort of thing happened with Guided by Voices and Elliot Smith. Then, the unthinkable happened. Kurt Cobain, the leader of one of rock's most gifted and promising bands, Nirvana, is dead, and this is the story as we know it so far. With this news, the music industry pretty much doubled down on their hunt for the next Nirvana, desperate for a slice of that indie pie. What resulted then in the mid to late 90s was really the pinnacle of this indie sensibility, with albums being pumped out left, right and centre in the US and the UK. The success of Nirvana, along with Sonic Youth and The Smiths in the UK, opened up a new world of music, writing the rulebook on this new indie sound. Lo-fi vocals, feedback in the mix, subjects of feminism, irony, counterculture, emotion. So-called indie was properly blowing up, built on the ashes of punk that Nirvana and grunge essentially blew up. Even the wildly popular Britpop was given a run for its money. All the while, though, a massive paradox was in plain sight. These indie offerings all had anti-commercial roots, yet were being released on huge commercial labels. Counterculture had become the culture. At this point, the essence of indie had become just a marketing tool, not just for the music industry, but the entire commercial world. It wasn't just a musical genre anymore. It was an attitude, a lifestyle, an entire culture. You'd hear indie songs on TV commercials and TV shows, but really the attitude of indie became a commodity everywhere. I mean, just look at this advert from the 90s for Pickway Shoes, totally capitalizing on the grunge sensibility. It was clear then that grunge, indie, alternative rock, whatever you want to call it, had really start to lost its way and began to suffer as a result. But I should say at this point that before his death, Kurt Cobain was well aware of what was going to happen and he actively tried to stop the spread. They would just refuse to perform Smells Like Teen Spirit live or play it awfully like in that fateful Top of the Pops appearance. They didn't want to indulge in the frenzy 
and their final album, In Utero, was so far away sonically from Nevermind. It was much more inaccessible, perhaps an attempt to shake off these phony pop fans that they had somehow gathered. So with this commercialization completely and utterly out of hand at this point, it could mark, really, the death of indie rock. But the story doesn't stop there. In the late 90s and turn of the century, the influx of indie began to die down. Mainstream pop, hip-hop and R&B was now on the rise. The Spice Girls, Hanson and Puff Daddy were topping the charts. In 1999, Britney Spears would storm into the global music scene, selling 1.3 million units of her debut one more time in the first week of release. The commercial world took note of Indy's downward slope and started funneling money elsewhere. A symbolic example of this would be the cancellation of MTV's 120 Minutes. This was the place to get your fix of alternative music. From The Verve to New Order, Smashing Pumpkins to Dinosaur Jr., the show famously premiered the music video for Smells Like Teen Spirit as well. This sort of stuff just wasn't selling like it had been before, so the money stopped flowing there. Stories of artists being dropped by record labels or recording budgets being slashed were rife at this point. Indie had become, well, a slightly more indie again. And then came along Napster in 1999, and with it, piracy and file sharing, particularly within the rock and indie communities. Napster and online sharing took the music distribution out of the hands of the industry giants, directly into the hands of the listeners instead. And this pretty much financially crippled the industry. People who knew how to download and share an mp3 file were mostly college kids. And what sort of stuff were college kids listening to? Grunge, indie, punk, rock. And that's why those areas of the music industry were hit particularly bad in all of this. So even more so at this point, rock and indie were on its knees, coughing up blood, praying for death. But little did the indie world know, a hero had already reared its head in the form of OK Computer by Radiohead, released 1997. While built on the wave of indie popularity, it would turn its back completely on American grunge and English punk and Britpop. Much like the Buzzcocks foresaw the crumbling of the English punk scene, perhaps Radiohead, being as forward-thinking as they are, foresaw the fall of grunge's explosion. Radiohead was forging a brand new experimental path of poignancy, alienation and complexity. Wilco, who many dubbed the American Radiohead, would also find success in the late 90s. The concept of indie was changing again, becoming a subculture once more. Which, in my opinion, was great news. Because the era of Naughty's indie, in my opinion, is one of the golden eras of music. Arctic Monkeys, Vampire Weekend, The Killers, Interpol, Death Cab for Cutie, Franz Ferdinand, Arcade Fire, Maximo Park, The Kaiser Chiefs, Fleet Foxes, The National, The Zootons, Band of Horses, The Strokes, White Stripes, LCD Sound System… I mean, the list goes on. The very thing that almost killed off the indie and rock industry, online music sharing, would have one hell of a redemption arc and helped to actually discover some of these incredible artists. Arctic Monkeys became massive through MySpace, along with Bring Me The Horizon, Panic at the Disco and Enter Shikari. New quality life was being breathed in again through this underground culture of sharing music online. Indie was indie again at its core, no big commercial giants anywhere in sight. And this leaves us now with one more question really, what is the future of indie? And to answer that question, I think we go back to the man partly responsible for its near death in the first place. In an interview with Ultimate Guitar, Dave Grohl had this to say, There is something about the independence that the internet has given musicians that makes me feel hopeful for the future. Pitting indie against the current state of pop music, he went on to say, Human personality has been sucked out of popular music. It's become so synthesized that it's hard to believe it's made by people. So for Grohl, Indie lives on, with the internet providing that independence. I think a shining example of the future of Indie are bands like Wet Leg, who, by the way, Dave Grohl is a massive fan of. They were picked up by Domino Records after hearing just four songs on their SoundCloud. They didn't need massive record labels pumping money into their recording budget for them to be successful. Their success is built on their sound, their creativity, not just as their ability to be a marketing tool. Back to Dave Grohl, he said this about one of Wetleg's tracks, Shays Long. It's fun, it's fresh, it's new. 
it's just completely entertaining. Great sense of humor, great beat, great riffs, totally hooky. It's fun, it's fresh, it's new. So in other words, an alternative to the current mainstream offering. That's the true essence of indie music. So I think indie music will be just fine for now. How about you though? Let's continue the discussion in the comments below. Please do like this video if you, well, liked it. It really helps get my channel to more people. And do subscribe to keep up to date with my weekly videos. And you can watch this video to find out just how Arctic Monkeys used MySpace to become massive. And with that, I'll catch you next time on Music Mongoose. Alrighty then, bye bye!